How does a writer create conflict? Uh, well, conflict is created by two opposing forces. So if we're talking about the main conflict in a story, right, that's the protagonist trying to pursue their goal, and then whatever sort of main force of opposition is getting in their way. So it could be, um, well, it can manifest in a lot of different ways, but it's whatever that main thing is that's stopping the protagonist or not allowing them to easily and quickly achieve that goal. Yeah, and it seems like, let's say with Hustle, which we were mm -hmm. talking about earlier, the Adam Sandler movie, it's a pretty clear you know, idea of what that conflict is. But if you look at, let's say, Forrest Gump, an older version of a movie, um, it's not actually that clear. There's many things he's encountering. Yeah, and that's another reason that I would I would call Forrest Gump a sort of an advanced an advanced craft story, right? Because it's pretty non traditional. It's you know you have one guy, and I don't know that I would say he has a very clear end point that he's working toward. It's um, a little bit episodic. We're sort of watching him kind of go through history, different notable points in history, and kind of accidentally showing up in the right place at the wrong time or whatever. Um, so that is a, that's one of those stories that I think would be a difficult one for a newer writer to try to make work because if you don't have that sort of like standard framework of character pursuing a goal to give you that spine and kind of that main conflict to rely on, then you have to use other tools in your toolkit to create enough conflict and enough engagement to keep us invested, right? To keep us engaged in the story and sort of not checking out and, and turning it off. So I think Forrest Gump does that through like, you know, just the sort of novelty of the character, right? Like he's, what, what's that guy going to do next? Like, where's he going to show up? And what, what um, you know, famous moment in history are we going to show it, see him pop up in? So I think that's part of the appeal of that story. And then also within, within each kind of little segment of story, I do think that there is conflict. It's not like I'm saying that it has no conflict, but uh, I think it happens, you know, in sort of, like instead of happening kind of big picture across the whole movie, if I'm remembering it correctly, it happens more in self-contained segments. And then you also have these sto these like longer storylines of like his um, love for Jenny, right? His relationship for Jenny, which weaves in and out of the other stuff that's happening, if if I'm remembering that right. Yeah, no, that's excellent. And and then if you look at Crash, which I know we brought up earlier, that is like nothing but conflict, yeah. which is the through line of basically the story that ties all the characters and different stories together. Yeah, so that one has so many, I think it has like three or four intersecting storylines, right? And each one has its own sort of main conflict that we're following. Um, and then part of the appeal of that too is seeing how those storylines intersect, because that's kind of the 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 point of the story or the concept of it. How can goals of the protagonist and antagonist oppose each other to create conflict? Uh, well, there's a lot of different ways. Um, I think that you know, if you look at if you look at the movies that you like, <laughs> you'll you'll probably see that they the main conflict falls into a few different categories. Um, it's not always the same from movie to movie. Um, sometimes the protagonist has a goal and the antagonist is trying to stop them. Sometimes the antagonist has a goal and the protagonist is trying to stop them. Um, sometimes they both want the same thing and so they're competing for you know a, a prize or a, a thing that only one of them can have. Um, and then sometimes they just happen to be you know, the protagonist and antagonist are just two characters who each have a goal that happen to conflict with each other. So they're getting in each other's way. Um, those are kind of the ones that I've noticed are the are the most common versions of that. Sure. And then if we go back to Bridesmaids, that there is, it seems like all of them have a common goal, which is to be accepted amongst their peer group. Yeah, well, if we're talking about the story goal, the more sort of like plot specific um, thing that the protagonist is trying to achieve. So it's actually um, the antagonist is Helen, which is the, the Rose Byrne character, right? And she wants to take over our protagonist's friendship. So she's the, the rival for this best friendship, right? That Annie, our protagonist, has her lifelong best friend. Um, so when Annie discovers that, about the Helen character, that's when she forms her goal to stop the antagonist, right? So it's just sort of, 
you know, it's a little bit of, um, it might sound very technical or very like theory heavy, but I think these are just tools that help you understand your own story and understand how your particular story works. So it's not that I'm, I certainly don't mean that you have four different types of conflict and you have to use one of them. I think if you, you know, if you've come up with an idea that you're trying to develop, trying to look at it through these four types of conflict, right, or these four kind of like conflict dynamics, if you can see that your conflict falls into one of those categories, it just helps you understand like, oh, okay, so if mine is like this, then that means, you know, it gives you it gives you a little bit of guidance in terms of, okay, so that means the antagonist has to come up with their goal first so that then the protagonist can find out about it and form her story goal, right? And that gives you a little bit of guidance in terms of like, okay, so that's the order that things need to happen in so I can break down the plot of my movie that way and it helps you write it, so. Right, and it seems like in some films, the antagonist doesn't really turn out to be the antagonist at all. Mm -hmm. or, or maybe that's just how I'm seeing it. And then others, it's clearly that was the antagonist and they were defeated or they, they were win whatever way. So Silence of the Lambs, we know that definitely he's the antagonist, but in in, in Bridesmaids, mm, it's kind of not, you know, maybe Helen is not totally. It's just that they both had their own sort of needs and they were just getting in the way. Yeah, and I think that that, you can look at that too as being like appropriate to the tone or the style of what you're writing, right? Because it might have felt weird if Helen, <laughs> that antagonist was, you know, had seriously kind of like evil designs on Annie <laughs> and all that stuff, right? So the humor in that keeps it, you know, that that's also a guide in terms of like what types of conflict are going to work in this. Um, so those two characters, you probably have a little bit more empathy for El for Helen than you do for <laughs> Buffalo Bill. You even though you learn why he's doing what he's doing. Uh, Helen is more of a real character and the comedy comes from, you know, the, these kind of like wacky situations that our protagonist gets herself into, you know. Sure. And we look at maybe Helen, it's more about vanity and sort of serving her own ego. And, yeah. But, but then you find out that actually she's very empty and so it's not, it's you feel for her in the end. Like, yeah, they you want to hate her and then you realize, I don't actually hate you. Yeah. yeah, they do a good job actually of revealing that she is not sort of the, I mean, she is sort of shallow and and focused on status and, and all that through the movie, but they do reveal that she has a, you know, an emotional need of her own. She's lonely and she's in an unfulfilling marriage. And so you kind of end up growing, I think, to at least feel for her, if not like her more by the end. And she's still the, you know, when we're talking about protagonist and antagonist, we're really just talking about like the mechanics of the story, not necessarily that she needs to feel like a villain or like a, you know, an evil character or even that you can't like her. You know, you can like the character who is the sort of antagonistic force. We're just talking about the the way the elements of the story work together to kind of, you know, create that that um, story engine or that, that um, spine of the story that we were talking about earlier. I think we spoke about this briefly in our last interview, but what are the four common ways characters challenge protagonists? Oh, um, well, I usually think about that in terms of like the supporting characters that are sort of around, you know, the protagonist. And again, I, you know, these are not, <laughs> not limited to four. There certainly could be many other ways, but I think that these are the patterns that I've noticed. Um, a lot of times the supporting characters will sort of help the protagonist through conflict, right? Like they create some sort of conflict with the protagonist, um, but that conflict or that pain that they're bringing into the protagonist's life is one of the sort of forcing um, mechanisms that that force that protagonist to grow and learn the lesson that they need to learn, right? Um, so the four that I've noticed are like, um, I think I call them like aspirational model. So giving your conflict, or sorry, giving your protagonist um, a, a model of what they would like to do or like to achieve or like to be. And that can create conflict because it you know, creates a situation where your protagonist is unhappy with where they are and they're striving for more. Um, there's also the cautionary tale. So creating, you know, creating, it's almost the opposite of the, of the other one where um, it's showing your protagonist what could happen if they continue down the road that they're on, right? So this is, you know, 
sort of like that that side character in, and this is such a minor, minor role, but in Crazy Stupid Love, that sad divorced dad at the bar, right? Like that's a cautionary tale. He does not want to become that guy, so he's going to continue on striving to be the womanizer <laughs> that he's being groomed to be because it's that, that cautionary tale. Um, it's a reminder to him. Um, and then uh, there's also, uh, I forget what I've labeled them, but um, you have sort of the uh, mentor character, or the person that helps your character learn that they're capable or they have it in them to do the thing that they're trying to do. Um, and that doesn't always have to be, you know, a nice mentor. It can be someone who pushes through um, tough love or through conflict, through challenging your character. But it's but the ultimate effect is that it's forcing them to grow and to accept that they are strong enough, capable enough, smart enough, whatever. Um, and then what's the fourth one, actually? Oh, so a new worldview? Oh, yeah. So that's challenging the way your protagonist sees the world, right? So um, a lot of times the transformation that your character goes through is is a is an it starts internally and then it manifests externally. So sometimes there's a supporting character that demonstrates the new way of thinking that maybe ultimately your character will adopt or it challenges their own way of thinking enough that they grow and they make that change that they need to make to sort of have a new attitude about the world or a new perspective, a new um, life philosophy that that was the sort of the point of the story, right? That was the growth that they needed at the beginning. Yeah, so I think in Bridesmaids was Melissa McCarthy, that one scene. Yeah. <laughs> so great. <laughs> so she kind of gives her a you know, kick in the pants um, and, and, and does it in a, in a sort of a sweet, tough love way. Yeah, yeah, that's a great scene. So she comes in and she's like, what did she say? It's something like, you know, the world isn't gonna like hand it to you. You have to go out there and take it. The world's telling you it's here to be taken or something like that. I can't remember the exact words, but but yeah, she, she gives her that. It's very funny, but it's also uh, the exact sort of like tough love message that Annie needs at that point. Sure, and she's literally on the couch, yeah. like you know, not just metaphorically on the couch. She's on the couch, feeling sorry for herself, and she's kind of. I think she picks her up, doesn't she, and throw her over her shoulder or something. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, and then with hustle, I can't really remember. I feel like there were mentor characters that were helping um, the Adam Sandler character. Yeah, well, what's interesting, I think, in hustle is that um, you know you don't have to have a, I guess, sort of like archetypal mentor for this to for this like sort of role to come into play. Um, any character, yeah, any supporting character that sort of helps your protagonist along that, you know, arc of growth, right, can can fill any of these roles. So, what's great about Hustle is those two guys. It's really their relationship. They learn from each other, you know. So, even though they're not like, you know, technically what I would call like a mentor to each other, that's not kind of their role throughout the whole movie, maybe. In terms of helping each of them grow and and sort of get to the point that they need to be in order to succeed in the movie, they do learn from each other. Like the basketball player learns that, you know, there's some people you can rely on. You can actually depend on someone. They're going to come through for you. Uh, and I kind of forget what Adam Sandler learns from the basketball player. But it's, you know, I think it's complementary to that, right? It's like... Um, if you keep trying, keep working, you can like, you know, succeed and not let people down or something like that. So um, talking about th that Melissa McCarthy character, quick, quick point about that. What's great about that character is that that speech she gives, right, to Annie doesn't come out of the blue. So that was the, the last thing I wanted to mention about her was that that character has that worldview from the beginning. So she, Melissa McCarthy, has that sort of attitude about you go out and you grab life, you you do it, you take what you want or you take the kind of life you want, you know, you don't sit back, you don't sit on the couch and like let it pass you by. If you want something, you go out and you try for it. If you fail, no big deal. If you look like a fool, <laughs> no big deal. But you, you have to try in order to get what you want. And so I think if, you know, the bad version of that relationship in that movie would have been if Melissa McCarthy was just a nice bridesmaid who came along at the right moment in the end to tell Annie what she needed to know, right? That would have felt sort of unearned and tacked on. 
Um, but because we saw that, you know, we didn't know where that was going from the beginning, but we saw that that Melissa McCarthy character was that person all the way through. So when she de delivers that message to Annie right when she needs it, it makes sense. It feels emotionally true, you know? Sure, sure. And just going back to Hustle real quick, mm -hmm. it seems like also, too, they both respect each other because they know their families are very important to them. Yeah. And so I think they both have sort of earned that. Um, and they become almost mentors to each other yeah. in some way. Yeah, I think they do. They they sort of, because they each go into it, I think, with certain preconceived notions about the other, right? Like our basketball player thinks that Adam Sandler's just this rich American who can kind of like... You know, he's got the the wallet of the the team behind him and he can do whatever. And over time they learn, they kind of learn how desperate <laughs> each one is, but they learn what's really motivating each of them and they bond over that, right? Because they each have a family to, like you said, each have a family to support. They learn that they each are kind of like on their, you know, this is this is it. This is the last chance that they have to kind of like make this big thing happen. So as those, you know, truths are revealed about each of them, it bonds them, it makes them grow closer, uh, which helps that sort of like partnership and help, helps them accomplish the thing. Yeah.